The North Sea has a long history and seen many people inhabit its islands. A very long time ago, the inhabitants of these islands would turn to the deity known as Sinuva, a great being who commanded control of the seas. The fisherfolk would offer their thoughts and prayers to her, hoping she would protect them from the devil. One day, two fisherfolk were asking for her protection. One of them was watching the waves intently, and thought amongst the waves he saw a Brigoli, a monster of the sea. He asked his friend for one of her lamabins and threw it into the water, hoping to banish the creature from them. But this was no sea monster. The autumn weather was beginning to change the water, turning calm ripples to violent waves as winter approached. The fisher folk knew that Terran was preparing to make his stand against Sea River and the Gore Valley was upon them. The water became rougher and the winds raised. Terran battled Sea River, their fights conjuring up fierce storms, each rolling wave a blow against the other. Terran was powerful and wanted control of the sea for himself. Sea River was weakening. She had spent all spring and summer keeping the sea at peace and was now faltering as Terran lashed and thrashed. Exhausted, Sea River had to retreat, leaving command of the sea in Terran's hands. The winter was harsh under his rule, with the turbulent weather seeming to last for weeks on end. During this violence, the fisher folk held strong, wishing and praying for the foul weather to end. Sea River heard their prayers and spent the winter resting and rebuilding her strength. When she was ready, she approached her own, initiating Vortelli. She summoned coils of seaweed, bringing them up to surround and restrain Terran. He struggled, trying to break free, but it was no use. Sea Mither had subdued him, and after spending his strength on the winter storms, he had no fight left in him. The seaweed dragged him down to the seabed and held him there in that deep, dark prison. The fisher folk emerged into the fair wind and weather. Sea Mither had brought them the joyful spring and banished her own. At least until next winter. Many a year ago, there was a young couple in love. They would meet in the evenings after the long day's work and soon they wanted to marry. The bridegroom set out one night with his yappy dog to the minister's house to make the proclamation. It was tradition for the best man to accompany him on this outing, so he went out to meet him. On his way, the bridegroom passed a kirkyard and his yappy dog ran inside. He followed him in and found the dog intently sniffing on a human skull. The bridegroom picked up the skull out of the way of his yappy dog. And he said to the skull, if you weren't dead, you could come to my wedding. The bridegroom put the skull back down and beckoned to his dog as they left the kirkyard and proceeded onwards. He met with the best man and they went to make the wedding proclamation. The bands were read on Sunday and the wedding took place a few days later. The wedding reception took place at the bride's house and just as it was reaching its height, there was a knock at the door. The best man attended the door and found a well-dressed stranger looking for the bridegroom. The stranger asked that the bridegroom come with him and talk. The bridegroom agreed, hoping that this wouldn't detain him too long, and he followed as the stranger led the way to his house. When they arrived, the stranger asked the bridegroom to sit in a specific seat at the table across from him. On the table, the candle flickered as the two men talked. The bridegroom fidgeted often, saying, I should be going back soon. The stranger reached out to the candle on the table, making a mark into the wax with the nail of his thumb. We can talk until this mark is reached, the stranger said and they continued their conversation. And the bridegroom looked at his surroundings, taking in the room until he looked up and saw that above his head, a millstone was suspended. 
held up by a single human hair. The stranger told him not to worry, as no harm would come to him, because he didn't let his dog harm the human skull. The bridegroom was very confused. The stranger continued, You invited me to your wedding, so here I came. The bridegroom looked at the stranger in disbelief. Now knowing that the skull he had found belonged to this man in front of him, the bridegroom once again said he should be getting back to the reception. And the stranger looked at the candle, which had melted down to the mark that he had made, and agreed that the bridegroom should be going. So the bridegroom, he hurried back to the bride's house. He stepped inside to find a strange woman sweeping the floor. She was dressed in a way that the bridegroom had never seen before. The woman raised her head and looked at him as he had asked where the reception had gone. She blinked and told him there had never been a wedding here in her time. Though her granny once told her a tale of a wedding where the bridegroom had left with a stranger and was never seen again. And the bridegroom stared at her in alarm, realising just how long he'd been gone for. The woman watched as the bridegroom turned to ashes where he stood. She shrugged and continued sweeping, brushing away the bridegroom's ashes, as if he had been nothing more than stray dust. And that, sadly, was the end of him. Moving a large nest of land is no small feat, but the fairies were determined to do it. By moving the nest, they could make a bridge which spanned the watery gap between the islands of Shetland and allow people to walk across without the need to rely on boats and good weather. The nest of Huland was their target. The ferries worked day and night to transport it eastward along the coast. By the time sun rose, one day, the ferries were exhausted and sat down to have their breakfast. They each took out a bowl of porridge, eager to tuck into their well-earned meal. The youngest of the ferries was Piri Meran. She longed to eat her porridge and regain her strength. She reached to her belt for the spoon, but it wasn't there. Piri Meran started fumbling about, searching for her elusive spoon. The commotion caught the gaze of the lead fairy, who promptly said, Ka fast and subshun for Piri Meran wants a spoon. The other fairies hurried and to finish their porridge, and Piri Meran sat patiently waiting for the loan of a spoon. However, the other fairies were in such a hurry that when they finished their meal, they jumped straight up and headed back to work. Piri Maran followed, hand to her growling stomach. The fairies prepared to lift the nest once more. They reached down and lifted. Piri Maran tried her best to lift her part of the nest, but without the nutrients from her breakfast, she had no strength. She strained under the weight of the nest. It was so heavy and her back hurt. She reached a hand to her back and let go of the nest. The other fairies couldn't keep it raised without her, and the nest fell, trapping Piri Meran under it as it went. The nest of Huland now lies broken in three. It is said that Piri Meran is still trapped underneath. A lesson was learned that day. It is very important to make sure you eat your breakfast.
There once was a girl with golden hair. She wore it long and free, for it refused to be tamed, an uncommon style for the time. The girl's mother had been bewitched by trams, and no one had been able to enact any rituals to help her. It was said that the girl's golden hair and sweet singing voice had been a gift from the trams, and that she was under their special care. The girl spent her days roaming the hillsides and townships, her sweet voice hanging on the breeze. A local witch had noticed the girl flitting from place to place. The witch wanted some of the girl's golden hair for herself. One day, when the girl was resting, asleep in a sheltered spot, the witch crept up and cut some of the girl's golden hair. When the girl woke, she was distraught. She wept as she wandered home. Nothing could console her. In her grief, she pined away and died. After she was laid to rest, the townsfolk would speculate that now that she was at peace, the girl's golden hair would grow back again. As for the witch, she was set to wander the hillside living in a strange manner followed by shadows of evil fancies as punishment for the rest of her days. Every night she was kept awake by the constant noise and sounds of the trows until eventually she was spirited away, never to be seen again. It was a joyful night in 1790. A sixerine had been finished and the following celebration had come to a close. The carpenter, who had been working so hard, was staggering home full of joy and good drink. As he wandered over the hillside, he heard a faint tune and so he followed it to its source. He approached an odd door which was built into the hillside. The sound seemed to be coming from inside. The carpenter opened the door and peered inside. Fiddle music streamed out into the night. And it would appear he had observed a secret trowel gathering. The tune was magical and had an ebb and flow to it. It seemed to bring out all the small sounds of the night. The trows danced merrily along, their feet stamping to the beat. The carpenter closed the door carefully and then hurried along to his own home, hoping that his drunkenness wouldn't hinder him from remembering that enchanting melody. And he managed to preserve what we heard that night so that many generations to come be able to play this trow tune. He named the tune after the first location that he heard it in, Eighth in Cunningsborough, and to this day that tune is known as the Eighth Rant.